Good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. How are you? We are turning on the lights here in the old church. The church on the hill. The little red brick church on the hill. There it is. This sanctuary was constructed around 1850. The land was deeded to us, us. You know, it's neat when you say us, because even though it was 1849 when the land was deeded, you feel a part of that tradition. In the Churchtown Monthly, I speak about the traditions of the church and how we are working toward, there we go, <clears throat> maintaining and honoring the traditions, but trying to move forward and to be a part of the traditions. Good morning, Anthony. Of this church is really, really cool. The little choir loft, which is now used greatly for the Musical ensemble. There's a trombone and a flute and a cello and a violin. There it is. Sunday was an interesting morning. It was a good morning. We try to keep things interesting here. And I don't mean by changing up you know, what we might preach and that sort of thing, or putting on dog and pony shows. Let me get a chair. Good morning to my... Oh, thank you, Debbie. Oh. That's a nice thing to wake up to. I had a busy weekend. You can still hear it in my voice. Can you not? Friday night, Saturday preaching at the wedding. Sunday preaching in church, singing, singing, I'm singing. Oh, don't worry, folks. I'll get my act together here. That's the church right there. <clears throat> Not to mention, like we're having this weird second growing season, this weird second allergy season. You should have heard me at the wedding on Saturday. They wanted, The kids wanted... How great is our God sung. And I, I started out, you know, trying to sing in the range that the song is written. In the range in which the song is written. What's the grammar on that? I like squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. I sounded like a 12-year-old boy. No offense to 12-year-old boys. So then after that, I had to drop it down like an entire octave. To try to get to, and I, it was a, it's hard. Live music is hard. But Sunday was fantastic. The music was magnificent. Good morning, Rosie. God bless you, Rosie. And then we got right down to business. Now, Sunday, you got to hear a different voice as a member. I preached, but as a member of the congregation came up and provided testimony and <clears throat> we did a little bit of that last year outside when we had a service, when we had four or five different individuals come up and just sort of tell their stories. Who they are, why they're here, those sorts of things. What has influenced them in their lives, et cetera, et cetera. How do we know them? Let's get to know them. And I think that it is a very, very good thing, right? Christian leadership is a team sport. Christianity is a team sport, not a solo sport, right? It's rugby, not swimming. I think rugby is a pretty good analogy <laughs> as well because you're, you're there, right? You're, you're completely unified and you're moving through a battlefield in essence, navigating 
right to left, and, and I wrote last week, and I'm going to write again for the Church Town Monthly, trying to navigate spiritually the battlefields that are out there that we're all experiencing as Christians as the pressures of secular progressivism press in and say, your faith doesn't matter. What you believe and how you choose to live your life does not matter. We will tell you what to do, and you will do it. Now, we can harp on constitutional rights all we want, but when I wrote about this in the Churchtown Weekly, um, I didn't it's not a matter of constitutional rights. It's a matter of personal autonomy. The author of our faith, the perfecter of our faith, has created us in his image. And thus, we are created as autonomous beings, so to speak, free moral agents. All that stuff in scripture about why Jesus came, who Jesus came for. By faith, we are saved. Repent is a verb. You don't say that if it doesn't matter. You don't say that if you believe that only a select few have already been chosen. Repent, what does it matter if I repent? I've already been chosen. What does it matter if I repent? I've not been chosen. Am I just supposed, supposed to put a show on for the world? But I digress. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we pray for your wisdom this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you are and all that you give, especially the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ, our Messiah. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, may you guide our conversation this morning. Amen. Well, you know, it becomes personal when the people that you know, Kim, you know them and you've known them for years now and you've spent time with them. You, it, it's a joy as a preacher to look them in the eye when they're at the altar. Kim, I, 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 I mean this in the most appropriate way. I want to put the fear of God in them. <laughs> We've lost sight of that reverence, that fear, that it matters. It matters if you come before the altar of the church and say, in the name of Jesus, I marry you. It matters. Right? And, and you are now moving forward as a married couple representing the church. That whole Ephesians 5 thing. Man, I could have gone off on that all day. Men love to hear, oh, women submit to your wives. Men don't want to hear, oh, and give your life up for her as Christ gave up his life for the church. You're not worthy of her respect unless you are submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and seek his will first as a spiritual leader in any home. It is like, you know what I mean? So anyway, like I said, in the most appropriate way, I really do. May I be, may I be perfectly honest? And I said, I've, in premarital counseling, I've actually talked two couples out of getting married one hat came full circle, and then they decided they did want what I was talking about. But I would rather, at that moment, someone say no and leave than go through with it and it be a disaster and harmful and hurtful and spiritually and all of those things. So, do we not, we, and I think in large measure, now we're getting... But like I said in the church, do we mean what we say in the church? I spoke on Sunday about how this great trend in the church toward personal revelation. I can see it as well in seminary. And this isn't a criticism. It's not all about 
personal revelation, but there is this trend in the church. What did God say to you? How is God speaking to you now? Bring your personal revelation to the table. Less of scripture, more personal revelation. And as I have preached and as I have said, there is such a thing as personal revelation and there is such a thing as being guided by God's Holy Spirit as we seek his will in submission through prayer. But to now move off, right? Move away from center to the point, good morning, Carol, <clears throat> to the point where it is all personal revelation. And you have whack jobs that are out there. And naming names, you know, the one that comes to mind is Beth Moore. When I referred to the one who said, I was in my bathtub and Jesus appeared to me. That was her. Like I'm in my bathtub and Jesus sits beside me and talks with and Come on, man. Jesus gave me this word now to give to you right before I came on stage. Right? Thank you, AJ. Andy. But we, we you know, move away from the word of God. When we talk about one of the attributes of God, this is the attribute that we're kind of toying with that we must be very careful with. And that is the attribute of his immutability. Now, what does that mean? It means simply that he was the same yesterday as he is today as he will be tomorrow. He is a free moral agent to be sure, but on a completely different level than a human being, for he is sovereign over all of creation. But his attributes do not change. He's not merciful in one age and unmerciful in another. We see that in the word of God. The word of God, if we are actually teaching all, the whole body of scripture, then our congregations should understand about wrath, judgment, wrath, mercy, grace. Judgment, wrath, mercy, grace. And the idea of what just judgment is comes from God, not us. The idea of what mercy is and entails comes from God, not from us. He is the definition of those things. And we find those definitions here. In large measure, we see and experience through his word. Good morning, Mary the immutability of God. The same God in Genesis is the same God in Revelation. The same judgment that is passed in Genesis 3 is the same judgment that is passed in Jesus' return as we read through Revelation or Matthew 24. It, right? So when we start saying, well, Jesus told me or God told me, or fill in the blank. We can very easily begin to interject our own characteristics, our own traits. And thus, as we always do, if my friend Dennis is on here, we always talk about this, recreating God in our image. I would rather have a God that I have molded and shaped and turned into my friend. Turned into someone or something that I can control. Turned into someone or something that I can understand easily. If there's a natural desire to do that, and if you are an attention whore, like many of these pastors are, then you're going to do that because you're going to stand there and say, God told me I'm so special and now, and you're not. 
So God told me this and God and this because I have a special connection. Look at me. Look at me. We know that that is wrong. We know that throughout Scripture, when God is actually speaking through a person, do you know any of the stories of the prophets? Surely they were bold when they spoke, but doing it for the sake of attention and money and fame and their own personal glory was the last thing on their minds as they were being beaten and stripped and stoned and murdered. <clears throat> points of discernment. We talk about that in the church, points of theological discernment. What is your preacher preaching? the glory of God so that your will may be carried out on earth or the glory and the power of God so that his will may be carried out on earth. Well, we like our will a lot better because chances are I'm not willing for myself to go be a martyr or to go be even made fun of at work or to go be pushed to the margins for my beliefs or to go be fill in the blank. Chances are my will is not in alignment with God's will. Thus, we seek God's will, and that can scare people because what is God's will? Well, let's find out. We know that his will is to expand the kingdom of God. But what all does that mean? What all does that entail? What all might that include in my life? It may be a life of embedded preaching here at Churchtown and just simply knowing and serving this community, blooming where you're planted, right? I am where my feet are type of a thing. It may be going wherever he may send me and doing whatever he may ask me to do that may be dangerous or whatever. It may be being a solid Christian now and as the pressures of the world press in, maintaining some Christian integrity and background, backbone regardless of circumstance. Exactly. Dale knows, right? Dale knows not to come to me and say, God's not been speaking to me lately. I feel like I'm in a desert. Well, what, what, you burned all your Bibles? Hey, look, whoa, hey, all, whoa, God's speaking to me. It's in the word of God. I don't mean to be such a smart aleck. Yeah, I do, well, I'm a smart aleck. But God is never silent. He has given us his word. You, there may be times in your Christian walk, as we Christians like to say in our Christianese, that you feel intimately connected by God, by the power of his Holy Spirit. And there may be times when you don't. But there is never a time when God is silent, so long as a Bible is in your hand. Why do you think that throughout the course of history, every what is the number one book that any authoritarian government wants to get rid of first? The Bible. Get the Bibles out of people's hands. That's what Satan is saying. Get the Bible out of people's hands because God is speaking to them through the Bible. Oh, I wish we would still teach history in school. The power of God's word. Right? The power of God's word. So there we are. So we're, you know, we, 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 need to be careful because as we stray away into this idea of personal revelation, then as a congregation, you can begin to seek this divine revelation when you meet together. 
Now you're moving off into this new apostolic reformation stuff where it doesn't count unless people are rolling on the floors and laughing and passing out and glory clouds and feathers from heaven and gold dust and, and chaos and, and, you know, nothing counts because that's the Holy Spirit moving. Because we know all throughout scripture, the Holy Spirit comes and creates absolute chaos and mayhem. Not. But we are led there in the self because we are seeking what we want. We think God should be behaving this way. We don't like any dry seasons in our life or anything of that nature. We want to mold and shape not only who God is, but how he behaves so that we, I really want to be connected. Because uh, reading your Bible, being connected to God through reading scripture, boring. Well, I can't, that's a you problem that I can't help you with. I'm telling you what is the truth that God is never silent because he has given us his word. There are indeed times when we experience spiritual mountaintop moments. There are indeed times when we experience the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our grief and suffering, one and the other. And there are indeed many, read Ecclesiastes, please. There are indeed many, much of that in-between time when you wake up in the morning, you take care of yourself, you take care of your business, you take care of your family, right? <clears throat> Hopefully along the way, you're engaged in the word of God. You're engaged in prayer. You take care and you go to bed. You wake up in the morning. You take care of yourself. You take care of your family. But I don't want that. And if it's going to be that way throughout the course of the week, then I want to go to church. And I want woohoo. Can't promise you any of that. I can promise you that the truth of the word, right, of the truth, the reality of the sovereignty of God is manifest in his word. It does. Exactly. We look in the now and God looks from the beginning to the end. We, we, and we have to accept that, right, Rick? And it's, it, it, I don't, like, that doesn't make me, like, I only see this much and there's this much. But like I said on Sunday, eventually it's going to boil down to, do you believe this? Right? When Jesus turns to Mary and says, do you believe this? I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Yes or no? You know, there's so much built into this that lends itself to what? Trust and faith. And those who trust in the name of the Lord, it says 1,700 times, not 1,700. It says so many times throughout the course of the word of God. And those who trust in the word of the Lord to the end will be saved. But, 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 I get you. So we spoke about that on Sunday. We spoke about idol worship on Sunday. We spoke also in the larger context about the very plain language of Scripture. Jesus speaks sometimes in more complicated parables. Jesus speaks sometimes in in very plain language and very direct. As we move through scripture, you're going to find a range of different styles and a different range of different ways of God expressing himself through the law and the prophets, through the wisdom and the gospels and the epistles. Isaiah 44 this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. The truth will say, indeed, it will set you free. The truth, 
capital T truth of Jesus Christ living, dying on the cross, and being raised again bodily by the power of God, dying as an atonement for our sin, willingly sacrificing his sinless life, the only human being, fully human, fully divine, the only human being for whom death was not required because he was sinless, willingly sacrificed himself for us. That's the truth. And the truth will set you free from the fear of death. It will set you free from death because you will be raised again to life in a bodily, in bodily form in the second coming. It sets you free now from the fear of death. And it sets you free from the power of sin and your slavery to your own desires. So indeed, Rosie, the truth does set you free. Free to live because you're not afraid to live because you're not afraid of the future. I, my heart, my heart breaks because Satan has just, it, Satan has so much of our population chasing its face mask right now, chasing its tail, afraid to live because they're afraid to die. You're afraid to die? You're afraid to live? You're afraid? What do you, what do, you do with that? You've become a slave to fear. You've become a slave to lie. How, I mean, what? <laughs> Always the disclaimer, we are free moral agents. We should act responsibly and take care of ourselves and others. We should seek the Lord's guidance in all of those areas. But you just watch and you have this sense of anxiety and fear, afraid to die, afraid to live, afraid to go outside, afraid for the children, afraid for the... It breaks my heart. I am the first and the last. There is no other God who is like me. Very, very plain language. This is the New Living Translation, but the, the plain language is the same in the New International, in the New King James, in the Berean Study Bible. It doesn't matter which translation, the NRSV you might go to. The language of Isaiah 44 is very plain. The Lord is laying it down so that even humans can understand it. Who is like me? Let him step forward and prove to you his power. You think you're all that? Come on. The Lord says, come, step up. Show me your power. Show the world that you are like me. Hey, famous, attention-seeking, money-seeking, glory-hound preacher. Show the world how you are like me. Let's see how that goes for you. you. Since you talk to me so much, since you have some sort of direct connection with me that nobody else does. Good morning, April. Show me. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times when I established the people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. God is proclaiming another one of his attributes, the attribute. He is Yahweh. He is sovereign. He is God, the Father Almighty. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is eternal, uncreated. 
There is no other. There are other spiritual beings in the spiritual realm. There are other what we may call gods, as we deem them spiritual beings, hey, Fred? But Yahweh is Yahweh. There is no other rock. This is the God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in whom we place our trust. Why? Because he is sovereign. Because he created human, Adam. Then he divided male and female. And then he brings to, together in marriage. He's done all of that. He's the redemptive plan of salvation is his and his alone. And the only human supernaturally created, fully human and fully divine, the only human that did not deserve God's wrath, willingly sacrificed himself for the sake of our sin. All of that, Yahweh, his sovereignty. And we go chasing after this and chasing after that. How foolish are those who manufacture idols? These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this. So they are all put to shame. And we talked about this very directly on Sunday. But what a fool would make his own God. Who but a fool would make his own God, an idol that cannot help him one bit. All who worship idols will be disgraced along with these craftsmen, mere humans who claim they can make a God. They may all stand together, but they will stand in terror and in shame. And I would profess that when he's going to go on to talk about a metal craftsman and a wood craftsman who, you know, the wood craftsman uses part of the wood to build a fire and to roast his meat. He uses the other part of the wood to to craft some sort of a little human looking or animal looking thing and proclaim it to be a God and bow down and worship it. How, it, how is that possible? Like logically. And as we carry that into a more spiritual sense, we just talked about the spiritual realm. And we, if you're standing in front of a congregation and you are presenting to them a false God of your own craftsmanship, a false god of your own craftsmanship, you're doing the same thing. You've created or recreated God in the image that you think is palatable. You are presenting to whatever congregation is choosing to listen to you, false God that you have not, one, you do not know one bit from scripture. Although you may be proclaiming to have had dinner with him last night and he gave me a word to give to you today. And here it is. Power, your power to be whatever you want to be. He cl claim it, claim it now. Woo claim it. Not there. Power, power, peace, joy, hope. So that God's will may be completed on earth. So he goes on and talks about all of those things. And then I love this. Verse 18. Such stupidity and ignorance. Right? All these craftsmen making all of these idols and all of the people that are bowing down to all of these idols all of this idol worship, because again, we are, we are created to worship. We are created to walk in the garden with God. We are created to be his partner. That relationship has been severed. So we are seeking. We are built to seek. We are built to give ourselves over in worship. And we will to something. Right, Bob Dylan? Everybody going to serve somebody. Right, all you Rush fans? If you choose not to decide, ah, none of this. You've, there's your choice. You're built that way. And God is presenting himself in the scriptures, faithfully presenting himself in the scriptures, who he is, 
what he is, what he has done. And the choice is yours. <clears throat> what stupidity and ignorance, God says. Their eyes are closed and they cannot see. Their minds are shut and they cannot think. The person who made the idol never stops to reflect. It's just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat. I used it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a god? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? The poor, deluded fool feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all. Yet he cannot bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hands a lie? Isaiah 44, read it. If that doesn't speak directly to you, I don't know what will in scripture. <clears throat> that was the last thing we spoke about on Sunday is that we talk about our, the intentionality of our faith. And I, I don't necessarily, I like to use the word intentionality because we're not forced to do anything in our faith. Just like you and your marriage should not be forced to do anything in your marriage. You should do out of, out of commitment, out of love, out of devotion, out of servitude. Out of a sense of servant leadership, if you will. Those sorts of things. So we talked about the intent. We talk about the intentionality of our faith, faith, intentionally being in Scripture, in God's word, intentionally praying, intentionally intensifying the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ, intentionally seeking how to serve in the kingdom of God, intentionally seeking God's will for us in our lives. God's will for us. So that God's will may be done intentionally, all of those things. And so we talked about intentionally examining our hearts for the idols that are there. And those idols can be ideas. They can be political ideologies. Those, ide those idols can be people, celebrity, or even your own spouse. Those idols can be relationships. Those idols can be material goods. And I, I said, oftentimes, we only want to think of idols as material goods because that's really easy to say, oh, look, I have that, I have this, but really, if it went away tomorrow, I'd be okay with that. Well, examine your heart even further for the idols that are resting there because they don't all have to be material things. And you see those material things, even though they may be material representatives, the Lord clearly says we turn them into gods, small g. It's a spiritual problem. It's an us problem. And it is all throughout scripture. Worshiping idols. We said we make the church an idol. We may make our liturgy, our theology an idol. We may make, and it's, it's when we talked about when we go off that path, we're worshiping idols when we seek, we cre recreate God in our image and we say, now you are God who I can relate to. So now you are speaking to me. I like what you're saying. You're doing all these things that I like so much. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping an idea of God that you have created as an idol. Without the, that intentionality, without that grounding in his word of who he was, who he is, and who he will forever be, 
We can become lost very quickly. Even when we make, we don't make an idol out of Yahweh, we make an idol out of the idea of a sovereign God. Because we have, we say, oh, I like that idea of a sovereign God. Now, how can I recreate him to make sure that he serves me the way I want to be served? Striking a chord anywhere? Hopefully. I told the congregation on Sunday, get in the pew, put your seatbelt on because I'm about to spiritually slap you. That's what you get if you come to church town. Spiritually slapped. But if we're not preaching the truth, then we're wasting our time. This isn't a game. This is a matter of heaven and hell. It's a matter of life and death. And Dale, in October, your congregation's gonna get a full dose of Isaiah 44. God-centered, not gift-centered. I like gifts. We do lose sight. We lose sight of God, who God really is because we have recreated him in our image. I love the idea of a sovereign God who has all power. Now, how can that power serve me best? There's where we go with it because we are so corrupt and so depraved. When we learn in scripture, how can that power and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit serve him? And oftentimes we find ourselves serving others. We should, we know we are, serving others through him. Right? He is serving the people through us. Churches aren't built to serve people. Churches are built to worship and serve God. God will serve the people through the church. Thank you very much. Father, we pray that your wisdom somehow, some way seeps through these words, this simple speech. Lord, we pray that your power, your wisdom, your vision, your purpose, who you are, is made known to all who say they follow you and that you are enough. Who you are is who we worship. Guys, I'm taking a couple of weeks off. We are heading out on a nine night vacation and I'm going to move through a couple of weeks and just stepping back a little bit, a little time away, a little time before we hit the holiday season, shall we say? You know how much I love you. You know how much all of this. I'm going to take a step back so we won't see you for a couple of weeks. And I know you're going to be okay. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to stay or we can't stay in touch. You need anything, you reach out. Many of you do, and I appreciate it so much. And I reach out to you, and I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Steve. That's exactly what I'm preaching. That'll preach, as they say in the biz, right? God bless you guys. I love you, and we'll see you again on Turning on the Lights.